One of the biggest Hollywood blockbusters this summer is about the earliest days of World War II. Today's guest is an acclaimed chronicler of the Americans who defeated the Axis powers and saved civilization. He's Tim Gray, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in historic Newport, Rhode Island. My co-host, as always, is G. Wayne Miller, an award-winning journalist from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is our effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. And that description applies wonderfully to this week's guest. Tim Gray is chairman of the World War II Foundation and an award-winning documentary filmmaker whose films chronicle the personal stories of America's World War II veterans. Tim, thanks so much for being with oh, us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. So you've just finished your 20th film, and uh, but you began your career in broadcast news. Right. And so I'm wondering, just for our audience, if you could briefly tell us how you went from that universe to the work you're doing now. Well, since I was about six years old, I've always had this interest in, in World War II. And, and mostly the personal stories. I picked up one of those World War II encyclopedias when I was younger, and I thought, you know, th this generation is incredible. Their, their stories of perseverance and courage and, 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 and the horror of what they went through on both sides um, just fascinated me. So I had a diversion of about 15 years as a television sportscaster, and it, it was great because being a journalist, um, as Wayne knows, it, it prepares you to do a lot of things. It prepares you to communicate, it prepares you to, to write. So I was able to take what I learned yeah. as a journalist for 15 years and really combine it with, with my passion, which was World War II history. You know, the, one of the, we're gonna talk about some of your films, uh, but more broadly, uh, you know, one of the big blockbusters this summer is the film Dunker. Sure. Um, why do stories about World War II continue to resonate? Uh, the Wall Street Journal did a, a great story about that, and, and basically what they said, along with some other newspapers who tackled the same subject, was clarity. People today are looking for clarity. There's not a lot of clarity in the world, especially when you're fighting an adversary. Back then, it was pretty, pretty clear. That it was good versus evil. We knew who wore the, the white hats, and we knew who wore the black hats, and, and that really hasn't been the case since the end of World War II. So in these times when, when people don't know who, who we're fighting or who our opponent is, um, and America seems to be divided on so many levels, uh, people look back on that time between 1939 and 1945, and especially the years the United States was involved, which was 1941 to 1945, and they saw a country come together as a team they saw women on the home front working. They saw young children collecting scrap metal. They, they saw people sacrificing. Um, they saw 16 million Americans sign up to, to, to fight against tyranny and to fight for freedom. So when they look back at that time, they see clarity. And, and I think that's what America is looking for today. Mm -hmm. And that's why films like Dunkirk and Unbroken mm -hmm. and Fury and obviously the old ones like Saving Private Ryan are still so popular because um, you look back at that time and say, you know, wow, we, we came together for God, we came together for country, but most of all, we came together for our fellow man. Mm. So we live in a time when there are certainly many global threats. Kim Jong-un recently, most recently, terrorism of all kinds, ISIS and so forth and so on. So it's not that threat and the possibility of war is, is new to our generation or no. to people who are living today, but it was a different kind of threat, World War II. Talk about that. There was something even bigger, it seems to me, at stake during the Second World War. Talk, talk about that. Well, prior to World War II, Americans were, were 
against getting involved in, in a foreign entanglement, as the old protest signs used to say. Following World War I, there was no appetite for the United States to go back to France or to go back to, to other countries such as Belgium and, and fight again. So about 80 percent of the, the population was against war. But that all changed on December 7, 1941, because there was a sneak attack at Pearl Harbor, and Americans felt it was unjustified, it was not a way to fight a war. Um, so December 7th really was, was the turning point um, for, for the United States. Up until that point, there was just this feeling that we should not get involved in what was going on in Europe. Um, Great Britain was fighting alone. They were fighting with France. Uh, so it was Pearl Harbor. I look at Pearl Harbor and say that was the defining moment. That, that did a 180-degree turn in, in Americans' um, involvement in, in getting into this foreign conflict. And um, I, I look at the reasons why. There, there are lots of reasons why. But America was unjustly, unfairly attacked. It was a sneak attack. There was no warning. And, and Americans thought that was, that was unfair. And then Hitler, of course, made a huge mistake, which was four days after Pearl Harbor, declaring war on the United States. And, and that was really the beginning of the end for, for, for Germany. So certainly through all of your filmmaking about World War II, the thought has crossed your mind, what if the Allies had lost? Right. Hollywood has certainly taken a look at that in many different ways, most recently with uh, The Man in the High Castle. Exactly. So, which I, I don't know if you've seen or not, it's an amazing piece of, mm. of, of cinema, but yeah. it's fiction. Have sure. you ever thought of where we would be today if America had lost? Because it's a question I think that is still relevant, or that people certainly still ask seeing your films, learning about the war. There, there were many times when um, the, the British early in the war and the French early in the war and the Allies in the early part of the war could very well have lost. Dunkirk is a great example of that. You're talking about the Allies, um, the, the British 300,000 soldiers getting off that beach who were available to come back to England to defend England against any German invasion in Operation Sea Lion, which was the attack, or to go back out and fight again in North Africa and, and France. So there were many, many times when the Allies could have lost World War II. What would the world have look, look, looked like today? I don't think the Germans would have invaded the the United States. I think Europe would have been totally separated. England would have capitulated. Um, and, and Europe probably would still be under some kind of uh, unilateral rule that, that, that had to do with, with Germany and the war. But my focus really hasn't been on what could have been. My right. focus has always right. been about the guys, the men, the women who were involved in what was and, and how they fought that war and how they, they dealt with it. But there, there are a lot of scenarios out there you can talk about if, if, if Germany had invaded England and the United States stood alone and would, would the Germans have invaded the United States and New York City and, and plans were being made to partition parts of the United States for the Japanese and parts for the Germans. and, and, and you can think about all those scenarios, but it didn't. It, thank God, it didn't come to fruition. There's a lot of fiction that's been that's been uh, produced around that. But let's talk about your stories for a moment. So, the the one of the things that I love about the films that you make is that they are individual stories set against this enormous cataclysm that 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 affected the entire world. Why tell those personal stories uh, about the war? I think because we can still learn so many things from the men and the women who went through that, whether they were survivors of the Holocaust, whether they were on the home front b building B-17s, whether they were fighting on the front lines. Um, I just think it's the lessons. And all we have left right now are the personal stories. We know the strategy of the war. We know why we invaded Normandy. We mm -hmm. know why we invaded uh, the islands in the Pacific. But to me, because we have so few World War II veterans left, there are only about 800,000 left in the United States of the 16 million who served, to me, I'm fascinated by the personal stories. Because you have 16 million who served, not one of those stories is the same. Mm. You've got guys who worked on the home front in Washington, D.C., behind a desk. Their, their story is totally different than somebody else who, who was on the front line. You have two similar soldiers sitting in the same foxhole during the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes in the winter of 1944, and their stories are totally different. They see the war differently. So 
there are so many individual stories that came out of that war, and I think the lessons are the big thing. And that generation came out of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So Tom Brokaw always referred to them as the greatest generation, and I always called them the toughest generation because their parents didn't have jobs, their parents told them to work hard, uh, they didn't have much. They went on to fight a war like it was a job. Mm -hmm. And when they finished with that job of winning World War II and saving the world, they came home and, and humbly rebuilt America, and, and, and we are who we are today because of what they did. So I think sometimes when I look back at that generation, I think we need to get back to those values. That wasn't the selfie generation. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the look at me generation. That was a generation that came out of the depression. They were tough, they worked hard, they believed in God, they believed in the United States as a country, and they didn't go around with a sign that said, you know, I helped win World War II, and they're still that way today. They're in their 90s, and they're not going around saying, look at me, mm. and, and I just look at them and say we could learn so much from them still. So mortality is very unforgiving. It is, every time. <laughs> every time, <laughs> without exception. Do you feel like you're in a race against time? Yeah, absolutely. My window is closing rapidly, and um, I mean, all my wife likes to joke with me. She said, you know, all your friends are in their 90s, and I say, well, I like to hang out with them because they still teach me so much, but, but again, we're losing about six or 700 of these guys every day, so my window is closing. So we're trying to get to as many of these men and women as possible. And, and we've done over, I think, 300, 400 interviews with World War II veterans that haven't been in our films, that haven't seen the light of day. Wow. And wow. most of those veterans, whether they served at Guadalcanal or were there at Stalingrad, um, most of those guys we've interviewed in the last five years are gone. So will, will those interviews be archived somewhere at some They'll point? end up in a film or they're going to end up on our website. So, so they'll be accessible They'll to be the, accessible to the for public. free for, for students, for researchers, for educators. We want them to experience what that generation is. So that's was a whole about. lot more than your films. I mean, that's a, a, sort of a treasure. I mean, this that, this is the next treasure. step of what we want to do. Yeah. We, my ultimate goal is to create an online portal that's the most extensive for the personal stories of World War II veterans in the world. And to make our documentaries free, to make these interviews wow. free, where students and researchers can go and present it in a form where how kids learn today. Yeah. We're not putting a 30 minute interview up there. We're putting a four minute clip of the best interview of that veteran from from Stalingrad. So someone can get an experience of what it was like to be there and then take the next step, which is to go find a book on Stalingrad, to go watch a movie on Stalingrad. And what all these films do, like Dunkirk and the other films, is Band of Brothers, The Pacific, everything else, they keep the conversation of World War II moving forward. They keep it in the public eye. And I think that's the most important thing that we do is we keep that in the public eye where a grandson or a son will say, you know, I saw one of your films and I went and asked my dad and he finally told me what it was like to be on Okinawa. Wow. Well, good for you. That's a wonderful thing. Do you, uh, so, you know, there are uh, to this day uh, uh, parts of the world, I'm thinking in this case, parts of France uh, in the low countries uh, that are still tremendously grateful Very. to the liberation uh, that they've that they, that they, that they that, that, to their liberation by the Americans exactly. in 1944, 1945. Can you give us a sense of the power of I'd that liberation? To. I'd love to because it is the most impactful thing that I see when I travel, and especially in Europe. Not so much in the Pacific, but but in Europe. When we go back with World War II veterans to Europe, and and they have a hat on that says D-Day veteran, it starts when we get to Logan Airport. The, really? the, the women behind the Air France counter or the men come out. They want their picture taken with the veteran. Wow. When they get on the plane, the pilots come out, they shake their hands. People on the plane applaud. When we land at De Gaulle Airport, the French come up, they thank these veterans. When we get to a place like Normandy, it is like traveling with the Beatles. Women come out of their homes with bottles of wine. Women who are six years old when these guys came to liberate their village, St. Marie du Mont or St. Mary Glise on D-Day. Wow. And they come out with tears in their eyes. So if you go back, even today it resonates, even if I go back as an American or you go back as a Brit or a Canadian, it doesn't matter what the politics are in the world. They will welcome you back as a descendant of someone who helped liberate their village. And it's, it's a remarkable thing. Kids at the American Cemetery come up to the veterans and they cry and they kiss them. And the veterans look at you and say, now we know why we did what we did. Because this 12-year-old person, kid, came up and, and with tears in their eyes said, 
thank you for helping yeah. our country. Amazing. Yeah. It is amazing. It's the most incredible thing I ever wow. witnessed. And we try to portray it's that in emotional. our films. Yeah. It is. We'll bring them to schools. We'll bring veterans to schools in Normandy and watch that generation interact, the 90-year-olds with the 12-year-olds. And the 12-year-olds in France all know Eisenhower. They know Patton. They know uh, de Gaulle. They, it's taught in the schools, and it's talked about at their dinner tables, and it's just an incredible thing to witness. Uh, we're going to take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. If you want to connect with me on Twitter, I'm at J.M. Lutis. Joining me every week in the co-host chair is G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. You can tweet Wayne at G. Wayne Miller. An audio version of Storing the Public Square can be heard three times every weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's POTUS channel. That's the Politics of the United States, channel 124. And our guest this week is award-winning documentary filmmaker Tim Gray, chairman of the World War II Foundation. You can follow the foundation on Twitter at World War II Foundation at WWII Foundation, we to be precise. To That's right. <laughs> um, it reminds me of Archie Bunker, WW2, right? Is yeah, WW2. Yeah. Um, so you've got a new film coming out in the fall, yeah. uh, 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 Journey Home to the USS Arizona. Tell us about it. I think it's going to be our best film. And it's a, it's a documentary narrated by Matthew Broderick. And um, it's a film that follows a family as they bring their grandfather's ashes back to be interred on the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor. Um, since 1982, the United States Navy has let Arizona survivors who want to go back and rejoin their shipmates. There are still over 900 on the ship um, from December 7th, 1941, to go back and, and, and have their urn put back in turret number four on the battleship. So we were able to follow this family as they discovered how America still felt about their grandfather. The family brought the urn to New Jersey, to Newark, and there was an honor guard there. There were bagpipers. The Port Authority police were there. The Port Authority fire were there. There was a speaking program. They flew to Dallas. Same thing. Speakers, uh, bands. Uh, they got to Honolulu. There were hula girls. Um, there were amazing welcome. Um, it was an urn. It was an urn of a guy nobody had ever heard of, but he had served on the USS Arizona. And the National Park Service let us go behind the scenes to show how an urn is prepared for internment. So the gentleman was Raymond Harry Jr., who was from Rhode Island, mm. and he became the 42nd USS Arizona crewman to be brought back to the battleship. And there was a ceremony attended by about 115 people. The daughter, the granddaughter, Jessica Marino, gave the urn to divers, and the divers back away from the dock on the USS Arizona Memorial, holding the urn up so the family and everybody else can see the urn, and then they go below the water, and they go down, and they put this urn on the USS Arizona. It is the most powerful thing that I've ever been a part of. It's incredible. Extraordinary. I can't wait to see it. And this will be on PBS? Is it'll that be on PBS. It'll be on Rhode Island PBS, and then it'll hit PBS National just after that. Probably end up on about 120 PBS stations around the country and um, probably have one of the premieres at Pearl Harbor. And, um, and I've gotten to travel lately with the five remaining USS Arizona survivors, which has been an incredible there experience. There are five left? There are just five left, yeah. And wow. uh, mm. we just went to the White House and met with President Trump in the Oval Office. And um, Tell us about that. It was interesting because you walk into the Oval Office and it, the first thing you think of is Disney World because it, it just, like the Hall of Presidents <laughs> yeah. or something. It's like, okay, now you're in the Oval Office and open the door opens and here comes President Trump and, and he's talking to the survivors. And the survivors were there trying to to get a medal for a gentleman who was on the USS Vestal, the ship next to the Arizona, mm -hmm. who helped rescue the final six survivors off the ship. He disobeyed a order from his commander on the Vestal to cut the, the lines loose so the Vestal could get away from the burning yeah. Arizona. He said, there are six guys still on the Arizona. I'm staying. So they met with folks at the Pentagon. They met with the president, and they're going to get this guy who passed away in the 1990s a medal. And it's their final yeah. mission. It, their final mission of these men who were in their mid-90s is to make sure this guy who rescued them off that fiery boat, that ship, um, gets his medal. And it was incredible to, to be a part of that. Wow. Wow is right. Yeah, they're incredible stories, and I'm, I'm and amazed every so time I do them. So how do you, uh, 
how do you find these stories? I'm guessing now at this point in your career where you've done so many films and are so well known that people come to you, and maybe that's not always the case, but so walk us through how you find these stories. You know, earlier in your career when you were just Tim from the, the Tim the old Tim from the block, guy. yeah, like J Lo from the block, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, Tim wants to do a story. What do you mean? I so, knew I knew a lot of stories just because I I always had a World War II book in my hand since I was six years old. So the more I read, the more in the back of my mind I said, okay, I've read a lot about Erwin Rommel. I wonder if Erwin Rommel's son Manfred is still around. So we contacted Manfred in Germany while he was still alive, and we sent a crew to go interview him to talk about what it was like to be at home in Germany when his father got the call that the D-Day invasion had begun and Erwin Rommel is at home in Germany when mm -hmm. the Allies are invading France. I look for opportunities like that. It was his I, wife's I, birthday, right? It was his wife's 50th birthday yeah. on June 6, 1944. So he talks about watching his father pick up the phone and all that was, I mean, that, that's just history in the making. And he was already 14 years old in the German army, Manfred Rommel. I read books all the time. My wife always says, how come you can't read a sports book? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> been there, done that. Been there, done that. And, 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 but, but I read these stories, and my first, and, or I do a lot of reading online. My first question is, is he still alive? Is that Rosie the Riveter, is she still alive? Yeah. Is that guy who survived Auschwitz, is he still alive? I, I, I know from my own historical journalism and filmmaking and, and whatever that it's one thing to read a name, yep. and we know this person, and yeah. are they alive? It's another to find them. Yeah. There's a long hunt, a long process Forensic. here. Forensic, yeah. Talk about that. I mean, The that, internet is a wonderful place, hmm. and the whitepages.com is a wonderful place. And so those may, are really big tools for you. Yeah, they are. Um, I'm on the internet all the time, and it, it's just locating where they are and, and trying to find if a guy's in Arizona, if a guy's in, in Denver or Boulder, Colorado, then it becomes... Is he still alive? So do, find him. There's another story that came out of World War II, and it was it's a story that has been lesser told mm -hmm. than what you're describing here, and that is it used to be called shell shocked. Yep. We would today call it PTSD. PTSD. Yeah. You know, and veterans of more modern con conflicts, mm -hmm. certainly Iraq, excuse me, and Afghanistan are more open about that, right. and, and as they well should be. It was more of a sort of a, a, a secret, or mm -hmm. something was kept to themselves. Yep. Do you tell any of those stories? Yeah, we do. Do you find any of those stories? You know what's unique? And how do you get these people to talk about it after so long? What is unique in what we do is we'll be sitting down with a veteran and we'll ask them particular questions about coming in on the opening wave at Omaha Beach on D-Day. And that veteran will break down and that veteran will cry uncontrollably telling his story. Maybe for the first time Maybe ever. Maybe for the, exactly. Because when we're done, the, the wife or daughter or son will come up to us and say, Never heard that story wow, before. Wow, I'm getting chills just hearing this. They are more likely to tell that story to a total stranger like me than put their family through what they went through. PTSD existed back then. But, again, coming out of the Great Depression, being taught to fight, that's your job. Guys came home and were able to put it out of their mind. Other guys committed suicide. Other guys drank uncontrollably mm -hmm, and right. ended up dying of liver cancer. I mean, they, they dealt or with... Or were with, reckless or right. wound up homeless. Or. There was a great documentary at the end of the war. I think it was one of those John Ford movies or something like that yeah. where they talked and they, and they actually went inside a ward and, and showed these yeah. men. Wow. And it was, it was very powerful, but you didn't talk about it back then. Patton's going around slapping soldiers who were yellow bellies and, yeah. and cowards. And in World War I, it was, it was shell shock. In World War II, too, it was it was similar battle fatigue mm -hmm. yeah. um, they would they would refer to it as and, and nowadays they've diagnosed it as PTSD but it exists in all wars it existed in the Revolutionary War it existed in the Civil War the War of 1812 yeah. Korea Vietnam I mean but we've we've come to know a lot more about it and one of the things I think is is interesting is we don't know who our opponents are anymore in war and and, and Vietnam was fought that way and, and there is no such thing as collateral damage anymore. I mean, you end up on CNN if you kill somebody that you shouldn't kill, that happens to be a civilian. So back then, there were no rules. I mean, we're talking about a time period when between 50 and 70 million people died. Mm -hmm. Would that be acceptable today? We, someone makes CNN when three people die right. in a war. Yeah. So yeah. back then, they knew who their opponents were, especially in the Pacific. They knew who the... So that stress 
wasn't there. They knew the Germans. They knew what their helmets looked like. They knew what their their uniforms looked like. They certainly knew who the J Japanese were. But today, our men and women are having this extra burden of stress. Are we killing the right person? Right. Is this a civilian? Are we going to end yeah, up in CNN? Drone pilots and, and people. You saw an American sniper. Yeah. American sniper yeah, course, was the yeah, same right, thing with, with, with Chris yes, Kyle. Yeah, yeah. You know, you make the wrong decision, you're going to end up on CNN. And back then, they didn't have that. And that's a whole layer of stress that today's generation has to deal with. I need to ask you a, a contemporary question. Uh, uh, you're the chairman of the World War II Foundations. You've made all these wonderful films about this generation. This past uh, uh, this past week in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, there were on display uh, dozens, if not more, uh, Nazi flags. Mm. There were uh, a, a crowd of young American men making Hitler salutes, mm. Nazi salutes. Um, what, what do you think is going on that we would celebrate this, this force of evil, that, or that there are some who would celebrate this force of evil that we defeated 70... Two years ago. Yeah, exactly. We thought we were done with Nazis, yeah. and 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 honestly, the group that that celebrates the Nazis probably they whether they read Mein Kampf or not, I don't know. Whether they can read, I don't know. Whether they've ever watched a World War II documentary, the History Channel, I don't know. Um, there's always going to be hate in the world, and it seems like the, the Nazis have always been the measuring stick since uh, about 1933 when Hitler came into power. That is the measuring stick. You don't go beyond Nazis. And, and people have joked about it. You saw the soup Nazi right. and Jerry Seinfeld and, 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 and Blues Brothers, Dan Aykroyd's character, you know, says, I hate Illinois Nazis, right. you know, with the, with the um, I just think it's the measuring stick. If you want to be evil, Nazi is where you go. Mm. And I would say most of these people who are giving the salute um, don't know anything about history. What do you think, the generation of guys that you are profiling, yeah. how do they respond to this? These are the guys they fought 72 years ago, 73, 74 years ago. And I think they look at it as uh, these young people who are doing this have absolutely no idea what they're doing and, and who they're celebrating. And um, I think it, the veterans I've talked to have said, you know, we fought the real Nazis a long time ago to try and rid the world of this, and here it is again. And um, I think they're disappointed. Um, but, I, but I think there's always going to be hate in the world, unfortunately, and, and um, Hitler has, has risen to that absolute pinnacle where if you're going to hate, then you invoke his name and you invoke his party, and, 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 and it gets people's attention, like it did back in 1933. Mm -hmm. It got people's attention. It got people's attention in, in Germany yeah. and the propaganda and everything that goes with it. But it's it's unfortunate to see we fought so hard against it to see it come back. You your work is absolutely inspiring, and thank we're you. out of time. But we really thank you for being with That's us. He's my Tim pleasure. Gray, the World War II Foundation. Uh, we want to thank those at home for joining us every week. If you want to know more about the show or the research we do on the role of narrative in American public life, please visit us online at pellcenter.org or you can always find us on Facebook and Twitter. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us next week for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>